Good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz and I work in external relations here at CSIS. I think this is our 56th uh, sellout in a row at one of these events. So uh, we've been doing this for five years and um, we have such a great panel lined up for tonight. We're so glad you've joined us. Uh, on this beautiful evening in Washington. The, um, unfortunately, we tried, but we're unable to get uh, the U.S. Chief Envoy to North Korea to join us tonight because Dennis Rodman was not available. Uh, he sends his regrets. Um, <laughs> all joking aside, uh, America remains in intimately involved in the conflict uh, between the two Koreas, the ongoing. Um, the point is certainly not lost in the families of the 30,000 American men and women who are serving um, overseas in, in the Koreas. Um, I'd like to thank Bob Schieffer and everyone at the Bob Schieffer College of Communication at TCU for their amazing partnership in bringing these dialogues to CSIS. We're so grateful to you, Bob, uh, and to the Schieffer School, Schieffer College, um, and to all of our friends down in Fort Worth. Uh, go Frogs. Um, finally, none of this would be possible without the generosity and the support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. Um, we are so appreciative of the foundation and all that they do for C CSIS and allow us to uh, put on these terrific events. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the man who's number one on Washington on uh, Sunday mornings, Bob Schieffer. Yeah. What I always say about that is one Sunday at a time. We were number one last <laughs> Sunday, and <laughs> we hope we'll be number one this Sunday. Uh, this is a great panel. Yeah, it's, you know, when you come right down to it, uh, uh, the news media can generally just handle one story at a time, and we've been kind of all focused so much, and rightly so, uh, on what's going on in Ukraine uh, as far as foreign policy stories, but uh, this is a reminder that these don't, things don't happen one at a time. Everything in the world today is uh, connected and there's a lot going on uh, in other places. So we really do have a, a great uh, panel. Uh, Glenn Davies uh, is the special representative for uh, North Korea policy at the uh, U.S. Department of State. Uh, he was appointed in January 2012 by Secretary of State Clinton to facilitate high-level uh, engagement with our other six-party talk partners. Uh, Special Representative Davies uh, served as a senior emissary for U.S. engagement uh, with North Korea, oversees our involvement in the talks. Uh, he's a career member of the Senior uh, Foreign Service, uh, served as permanent rep to the, uh, uni of the United States to the uh, Atomic Energy Commission before, uh, agency before he came to this job and the UN uh, uh, office uh, in Vienna. He's also uh, has served on the uh, National Security uh, Council staff and was an Assistant Secretary of State uh, for East Asian and uh, Pacific Affairs. Elise Labat, am I saying that right? It's Labat, but I've been called Labatt. much worse, so well, it's okay. Nobody can ever <laughs> pronounce my name, so Labat. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, That's Elise, okay. I apologize. She, uh, of course, as you all know, is uh, CNN's award-winning foreign affairs reporter. She is based in Washington now, but she's reported for more than 75 countries, has interviewed and traveled the world with five secretaries of state since joining CNN in 2000, uh, <clears throat> over more than a decade covering U.S. foreign policy. Uh, she's reported on many major global events and prior to uh, joining CNN, uh, she covered the United Nations for ABC. And then over here, uh, someone who needs no introduction, Dr. Victor Chow, Senior Advisor and Korean Chair here at uh, CSIS. Uh, he came here in 2009 uh, as Senior Advisor. Uh, he's also Director of Asian Studies and uh, holds the uh, DS Song KF Chair uh, in the Department of Government and School of Foreign Service at uh, Georgetown. Uh, from 2004 to 2007, he served as Director uh, for Asian Affairs at the White House on the uh, National Security Council. And we could go on and on. Uh, we have uh, more qualifications, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, great background for all of our people. Let me uh, just start with you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, 
uh, Davis. Um, the United States had a summit uh, in South Korea. The president was there. Uh, how did that go, and uh, what do you think that was accomplished? Well, I, thank you very much, Bob. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, let me uh, quickly uh, give you um, uh, some background on that. The president arrived just after this terrible tragedy that had struck South Korea, the, the sinking of the seawall, a ferry, uh, uh, in which tragedy perished uh, hundreds of, uh, for the most part, very young South Koreans. Uh, and so the president arrived uh, very shortly after that, and it was a great occasion for the president to, to express condolences to the people of South Korea, demonstrate the solidarity of the United States uh, and Americans to the South Koreans as they dealt with this uh, terrible business. So from that standpoint, the kind of the people to people piece of it, very important. Uh, we have a very broad agenda with South Korea. Uh, it's not just about North Korea, though I know that's the, one of the focuses of today. Uh, our relationship has become almost global, quite frankly, in nature. Uh, and so whether it's uh, working side by side in, in Afghanistan, uh, working diplomatically on the Syria issue, uh, dealing with global climate change, uh, nuclear security, uh, regional issues, uh, really the, the, the world is now the stage uh, on which uh, South Korea and the United States together act. So it's a, it a, it a, a very important opportunity for the president to reaffirm our, our solidarity, our alliance with North Korea, in particular in the face of North Korea's continuing threat, but also a, an opportunity to discuss all of these issues, economic, uh, security and people to people. So we made a great deal of progress. It was a good uh, stop by the president. And it, uh, I think, is the case that South Korea is the most visited country uh, uh, abroad for the president of the United States, which tells you something about the importance of the relationship to the United States and I think also for South Korea. Dr. Chow, how would you assess? I, I, I uh, just give us a broader. Uh, overall view of how you think U.S.-South uh, Korean relations are right now? Uh, well, um, Bob, as you know, last year we celebrated the uh, uh, 60th anniversary of the alliance. Um, it has been one that has evolved from a relationship between two countries that were really just pragmatic partners in a war. They knew nothing about each other to a relationship today, as Glenn described, where they are operating together on the global stage, whether it's uh, with regard to climate change or best business practices or um, um, uh, nuclear issues, whatever it might be. And so I think this trip was a very important trip. One, because it made Korea the, the most visited country for President Obama, I think next to Mexico. I think uh, well, next to Mexico. But considering the proximity of I Mexico said overseas, to Washington. But, anyway. <laughs> uh, um, but more importantly, I think it was, it was again, just another sign of, um, uh, first, how much the two leaders get along. I mean, you, you can never un, uh, overestimate that in international relations, how well the leaders get along. And I think President Obama and President Park do like each other at a personal level. Um, but they also were able to use it as a platform to talk about the things they care about. I mean, whether it's uh, with regard to um, um, uh, liberal trade institutions around the world, or it's counterproliferation, or, or it's um, uh, um, uh, climate change or global health or all these issues are ones in which the two countries play very prominently on the world stage. And, uh, you know, obviously they had issues closer to home to talk about, North Korea, China, uh, their military relationship. But overall, I think it was just a validation of how strong and deep and robust uh, the U.S.-Korea relationship is. Elise, what do you think are the main challenges to this relationship right now? Well, I, I see two things, and one of the things that, that came out of the summit, I thought, was um, that, yes, everything is true, what, what Glenn and, and Victor say, and I'm, and I'm honored to be on the panel with um, two of the greatest minds in this town on North Korea, but I think that I look at the relationship between South Korea and, and uh, the United States like I kind of do with the relationship with India or India is a global power. There are a lot of w ways that the U.S. is cooperating with India, whether it's trade, whether it's counterterrorism, um, economically, people-to-people exchanges. But 
the relationship between India and Pakistan and, and what's going on in Afghanistan really dominates how people see the relationship. And I think that even though all these things are true in the US and South Korea have a very robust relationship, you're never really able to transcend the idea that when the president goes to South Korea, what is coming out of it? What is making those headlines? And that's what's going on with North Korea. And I think North Korea really plays upon that. I also think that the tensions between uh, Japan and South Korea um, really in, in some ways have, have hampered um, the U.S., Japan, and, and South Korea alliance from, from really uh, taking off, at least right now. Um, you know, obviously, South Korea very upset with you know, Japan continuing to uh, believe in its colonial, uh, pre-colonial aggressions, and um, there have been a lot of insults flying back and forth. And for the United States, who wants this, this cornerstone alliance to really help the U.S. with its so-called pivot to Asia, which we've heard a lot about the pivot to Asia, but we don't see a lot about the pivot to Asia. And I think that has hampered. In the United States, President Obama has tried in recent months to get you know, new, uh, South Korean and J Japanese diplomats together on a lower level. He hosted a summit between uh, the leaders of Japan and South Korea in The Hague in March before he traveled out to the region. And he's trying to say, listen, you guys have to get rid of your old baggage. We have to move forward. And this trilateral alliance is really the cornerstone of what we're trying to do in Asia. Well, talk about that. I'd like to hear both of you and what your thoughts are on that. Well, I mean, I, would, I have to agree with Lee. I mean, you know, many of us in this room are, have, have been or are alliance managers, you know, working the US, Korea, US, Japan, whatever alliances. And, and it is frustrating at times when uh, there's a very successful summit. You know, they make progress on missile defense. They make progress on wartime OPCON. They make progress on a bunch of different things. It's a great relationship. You know, they're unveiling a new global health security plan. And then all everybody talks about is North Korea, right? North Korea kind of steals all the thunder and, and really sort of pervades, you know, the, our, our thinking about the Korean Peninsula. And so I think that's a real challenge. It's a real challenge for the alliance relationship uh, and I think, um, for that reason, Pak Gane has really tried to talk about um, what Korea does itself on a global stage and doesn't allow simply the North Korea story to grab all the headlines. Well, what about North Korea right now? Sure. Well, uh, we're at an interesting moment with North Korea. I mean, I think the North Koreans are um, uh, acting in a kind of highly improvisational fashion. Uh, it's difficult to detect. Uh, any real thematic consistency there, except that they seem to be always defaulting in the direction of provocations and, and, and threats and unable to sort of uh, sustain uh, any more kind of positive outreach to the, to the outside world. And that's a, that's a huge problem. They are, of course, we all know, it's in the headlines. They are uh, issuing threats right, left, and center. They're attacking the president of South Korea on a very, uh, what's the Latin, ad hominem basis, you know, a very personal basis. Uh, they well, they're attacking uh, President they're Obama. They're attacking President on, Obama. Uh, and uh, even in the and, uh, Exactly. So, the language. So, it, you know, it's, some, it's sometimes difficult to divine what it is uh, North Korea ultimately uh, wants. The central challenge that I face in trying to deal in particular with this nuclear problem is how do we set up a diplomatic process going forward that can deal with what is the central problem, which is North Korea's acquisition of nuclear weapons and missile technologies, which threaten the, the region, certainly, uh, but also uh, threaten the world. So uh, it's difficult to do. We spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time in North Asia with the Chinese, with the, the South Koreans, uh, the Japanese meet with the Russians because they're part of this process as well. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress in terms of talking about what, the, uh, what it is we'd like to see happen. Uh, where we're uh, still uh, working is to decide exactly how that roadmap works. And of course, you always have in the background, as has been pointed out, North Korea trying to pull focus, uh, uh, provoking, threatening, uh, uh, launching rockets of various ranges, um, uh, issuing uh, challenges to South Korea and to Pak Gane. For me, one of the most impressive actors in, in this entire tableau is this 
a still relatively new president of South Korea, who seems to have a really excellent feel for the problem and seems to understand how best to try to get at it, despite uh, North Korea's uh, recalcitrance. So, remains a work in progress on the nuclear piece. We've been at it for 25 years. Uh, I think Victor himself has written eloquently about the challenges that various administrations have faced in uh, getting at it. And I just happen to be the latest guy kind of carrying the ball at, let's call it, the senior working level. Uh, but I remain optimistic. I think there are ways to get at well, it. Well, uh, you know, they were saying they were going to do another test here. Right, and right. then they kind of postponed that. Uh, right. Some people say maybe they wanted to wait till the news kind of quieted down before mm -hmm. they do that. Is that? Well, also, I think that you know, they know that the South Koreans are really diverted with this very disaster. And so they, it, you know, what we've seen is that the North Koreans want to have maximum bang for their buck, if they say. So, so when you say that the news dies down, not only the news about the threats about their possible tests, they do like to keep everybody off guard, mm -hmm. but they also want to have maximum attention. And so if there is a big crisis in Ukraine or there's this thing with the Nigerian girls, I mean, we talk about the fact that, you know, North Korea is this isolated, uh, place, but you can rest assured that the leaders of that the leader and his um, cronies um, definitely are watching the news, um, the news climate, and, uh, yeah. and they want to make sure that if they're going to do this, this is going to have a this is going to have North, uh, South Korea's full attention. And, and right now, I don't think I don't think they, they do. I just want to answer um, what what Glenn was saying about you know, what do what do the North, we don't really know what what the North Koreans mm -hmm. are, are up to in terms of. The do obviously denuclearizing North Korea is the biggest problem that um, the U.S. and its allies face in the region. But I, I think possibly in their quest to really go after the denuclearization, they're they're not figuring out what the North Koreans really do want. And if he loses his his nukes, um, what is the most important thing to to Kim Jong Un? No one really knows about this young leader, but they know that regime survival mm. is the most important thing. And so there are platitudes about, you know, we're not trying to get rid of the regime, but I think the United States and its allies have to make a choice about whether they do want to get rid of the, the regime. If they don't, they need to make that clear and provide, you know, not just lip service, but, but engagement and guarantees that they're not trying to go after the regime, and, and maybe that's how you start. And then it, if you feel more comfortable and there's some kind of engagement, then you, you go after um, the nuclear program. If you do, look, we're, we're trying to, North Koreans are starting to get things smuggled into North Korea, DVDs, um, ISB sticks. They're learning more about the outside world. Eventually, that country will topple. And the United States has a lot of activities that we've been reading about in Cuba and other countries that they could help in this regard. So I think we have this tendency to focus on the nuclear issue, but maybe we've had this myopic focus and it's, it's not really working. But uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in this. I mean, would they really be, uh, I don't think sophisticated enough, I think that's the wrong word, but would they be following the news so closely that they'd say, we're going to wait till we have a good slow news day before we're going <laughs> to do this nuclear well, test? Well, I mean, that, because yeah, that's obviously yeah. what the, has been suggested. By I think the answer is yes. Yeah, well, really? I think, you know, well, part of it, I think, part of the answer, I think, is yes. I mean, I remember um, when I was working on this issue with the White House, um, they did, still to date, their largest series of ballistic missile tests on uh, basically July 4th. July 4th. 4th. Yeah, yeah which was July 5th in North Korea, which was President Bush's birthday. So they had two meanings for them, right? <laughs> and then, of course, the first uh, nuclear test for the Obama administration was on Memorial Day, mm -hmm. right? So- I remember that. Yeah, yeah, so, so you do remember I. that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think they just pluck these dates out of the air. I think there is, there is some, um, some tactical de um, uh, decision-making that's done. At the same time, though, I mean, we should never discount the fact that there clearly also is not just a military, but a scientific rationale for their timetable for testing. So it very well could be that the reason they may have postponed, Bob, as you, as, as you said, or it appears as though they have postponed is because they might encounter some technical problem or they may be trying to do more uh, with the next test. Um, I think one of the things that's very clear today that was less clear when I was working this issue and when, when people before, 
you know, there was much more of a debate in the policy community, in the think tank community, in the academic community about whether the North Koreans were pursuing these weapons for the purpose of negotiation mm. or whether they were really pursuing them because they wanted to be a nuclear weapon state. And, you know, in a room this size, you could get 50% of the people saying it's just a bargaining chip and that's why they pick these dates because they want to get the maximum of attention so that they can negotiate. Uh, and the other 50% would have said, no, they're doing this because they want nuclear weapons. And I think today, probably if you poll this room, it would be more like 90-10. 90% of the people believe that they are clearly focused on becoming a nuclear weapon state. And therefore, these tests, whether it's missile tests or nuclear tests, are not just to negotiate or bargain, but because they want to be a nuclear weapon state and they want to be acknowledged as a nuclear weapon state. And this became very clear under this new leadership because they announced something called the Byungjin strategy, which is basically saying, yes, we would like economic reform and development because our economy is a basket case, but at the same time, we want to do this while being a nuclear weapon state, which poses a real problem for Glenn and negotiators because for 25 years, the US negotiating strategy was, you can have economic development, political recognition, all these things in exchange for your nuclear weapons. But can I, can I yeah. register yeah. violent agreement with much of what Victor said, I mean, I think that's right. This new leader has done us the favor in a backhanded fashion of making quite clear that he has no intention right. of meaningfully denuclearizing, and that presents a problem. But uh, it also is a clarifying kind of moment because it's now quite obvious what we're dealing with here. A clarifying moment when he decided to purge and execute his uncle pretty much on YouTube, all except the execution part. Uh, which we labeled instantaneously. We said this, was, uh, this demonstrates the brutality of the regime. It was kind of like we x-rayed. We, we, we all saw what uh, North Korea is all about. And we haven't just concentrated on the nuclear issue, even though that's what I am paid to worry about uh, every day. We've also spent a lot of time on all other aspects of this. Proliferation is a big part of it. And then human rights is key. And I think you know, long after these debates are over about what uh, how well we did or didn't do on denuclearization will be the question of what did you do for the 25 million people of North Korea outside the hereditary elites of Pyongyang, the other 90, 90 plus percent. You know, did you do enough to keep faith with them and find ways to, uh, uh, to, to put up in, in lights what it is they're doing to their own people? And so, so there are a number of areas on which we work. It's not just the nuclear issue as important as that is to our security. There is an envoy for human rights that you know, once in a lifetime gets into North Korea and is able to have some meaningless discussions. I mean, the North Koreans are not interested in, in what anybody thinks about their human rights record. I mean, this is the way that they maintain control over their people. I'm just wondering whether you know, there is another way of, of um, approaching the problem, even though that is true. We, there's human rights, there's proliferation. The main concern of, of this administration is, and, and of the allies is, is the North Korean nuclear program. And, and it, basically, isolation isn't working. The sanctions continue to leak. Um, I mean, how, what is the administration's strategy? It seems as if there's a kind of crisis-oriented, um, fragmented way of, of dealing with the problem, you know, it, it's kind of, I'm not, Glenn obviously is working hard every day and having meetings and, and traveling, but it's, it doesn't, it's not clear to the outside world what the, what the strategy is for our, is the, the six party talks, are they gonna bring them back? Are they gonna have another round? Are they gonna try again? Is there a way to reach the leader? I don't think that um, that's really clear. And I also think that, I think maybe the media is responsible um, and the academics are responsible that, that in a way, this, is a, this has become, yes, it's a, a crisis, but it also has become a little bit of a sideshow. Well, what is, the, North well, let's, uh, let's just talk about that. What, what is the strategy now? Well, the strategy is to ensure that uh, starting with the three allies, uh, but in this case, because the problem is on the peninsula, particularly the Republic of Korea, extending out to the five members of the six-party talks, uh, we call them our partners, there be as great uh, unanimity as, as we can uh, achieve on what it is uh, North Korea must do. We've made great progress on that. 
uh, sadly, a lot of diplomacy does have to happen behind the curtain. Uh, a lot of our talks with the Chinese were not in the business of retailing to everybody, as tempting as, as that is. As much as we try. As much as you try. Uh, but we have uh, achieved a level of success in hammering out what it is we need to see happen. The problem becomes in working through what we'd like to call the roadmap, uh, which is the how and the when of North Korean denuclearization. And the truth is, no secret, that the interests of the five parties are not perfectly congruent. Just the, that's just life uh, in the North Asian uh, mix. And so while the Chinese are mostly seized of the problem of stability, uh, because this is uh, on their periphery, uh, we uh, are mostly concerned with the problem of security. And so the argument we've sought to make to the Chinese, and I first did it back in December of 2011 on my first trip to Beijing, uh, is to point out to them that their so-called stability concerns and our security concerns really are kind of converging as the North Korean weapons of mass destruction program and their bad behavior, their provocative behavior continues. Uh, and it's, it's on that track of seeking a common appreciation and a common uh, plan for the way forward where we've made a great deal of progress. But we're a quarter century into this, as Victor's pointed out in many of his writings. We, uh, you know, this wasn't done in a day, and as President Obama pointed out in Seoul, uh, you know, this will remain uh, a problem uh, of which we are seized in the United States government. I'm an optimist. I actually think there's no solution to this except a diplomatic solution. Well, and I think we'll find a way forward, and I think we're making some progress. Do you see the six powers uh, talks restarting? I mean, it's been a while, right? That's, you know, uh, that's up to North Korea. It won't surprise you to hear me say, because North Korea needs to decide whether it wants to go down this path, rejoin the international community, live up to its obligations uh, and its uh, promises, its responsibilities, or does it wish to continue to isolate itself, uh, seek to go its own way, acquire these technologies in, uh, in contradiction to the uh, worldwide consensus? Remember, most widely subscribed treaty in the world, uh, uh, pretty much, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the result of the mid-20th century consensus among some very wise statesmen and women who decided we need to come up with a nuclear bargain to prevent the world from facing a couple of dozen nuclear weapon states by the end of the 20th century. Most of the bright lights of the 50s and 60s believed that by the end of the century we would have dozens of countries with nuclear weapons. We didn't. Why didn't we? Because they set up this regime, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Regime, the IAEA. It actually worked uh, to a great extent. And we didn't have that kind of breakout. But there is one country among the 189 or so, one country signed the treaty, walked away from it, tore it up, the only country on the face of the earth that's exploded a nuclear device in the 21st century. It's North Korea. So this isn't a US-North Korea polemic, though we will live up to our responsibilities. It's about the entire world community uh, uh, keeping up the pressure on North Korea. It's about China. Uh, Russia, the United States, Japan, Korea in the first instance, but it's about everybody else as well, uh, both in the region and, and overseas, because in a globalized world where, when you Google how to make a nuclear weapon, you get whatever it is now, 14, 16 million hits. This is serious stuff. And this is the vision the president laid out in his Prague speech. And North Korea becomes a particular challenge that everybody, all nations of the world need to work on. South Korea, the Republic of Korea, has been particularly valiant on this front. They seized on that idea. They hosted the second nuclear security summit. They get it. Uh, more and more world leaders do. 80 countries and international organizations condemned North Korea for their last nuclear test. So that coalition of concern is growing. And that's what I think, at the end of the day, is going to make a difference. In Victor, it. let me ask you this. We knew almost nothing about this young man when he became the leader of North Korea. Have we learned anything uh, of significance about him since he came there? Uh, well, he likes Dennis Rodman. <laughs> he, uh, Do we know why? <laughs> I, I, he watched a lot of basketball. Yeah, his father likes also likes basketball. He, I mean, so the, stylistically, there are, there are big differences yeah. from the previous leaders. And in a sense, in, in that sense, I guess one could argue that he is more attuned to Western 
uh, Western things and, and, and she clearly shows an affinity for them. Um, uh, but you know, what we know of him is largely what we know of North Korea, which is very little. And so policy often is reacting to the behavior rather than trying to figure out you know, what, uh, you know, what is driving the behavior. And you know, one could say that's a flaw policy, but when you're talking about the hardest intelligence target in the world, uh, at the policy level, you, have, you don't have much of a choice but to react to what the behavior is. And, and I think for that reason, the administration, rightly so, has focused on, you know, when they did change leaders, has focused on, look, we don't care who's in charge, we care about the behavior. And, and when we see, good, when we see um, good behavior, genuine commitment, we're ready to engage. I think that makes sense. Um, you know, I, you know, I, with Glenn, I think, you know, I, di diplomacy is the only way to resolve this. No one wants to see it uh, resolved in any other way. Um, uh, having said that, I, I do think, and I was a part of the six-party talks, part of the 2005, 2007 agreements. I'm just not sure how much of the six-party talks is left. Um, uh, your title is Envoy for North Korea, right? Not six-party talks, or uh, both, is it right. both? Right, I'm, I'm not the six-party Right, you're guy. the Envoy for, for Strictly North Strictly speaking. Strictly it's speaking, right, yeah. but, you, you, but I know you cover it all. But if it starts, right. I, I think I'll be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, would, I hope so, <laughs> I hope you'll be there. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I mean, the last meeting was 2008, I think. It's been six years. Um, if you don't do something for six years, you probably don't do it anymore. And. Um, and I think the reality, of course, is that the North Koreans really only want to talk to one country. Um, you know, they may talk to South Korea on occasion. They're flirting with Japan right now a little bit. But there's only one country they really want to talk to. And it's not China. You know, it's the United States. Um, and in fact, I think one of the, you know, it's kind of a, it, it's a kind of a vicious circle because one of the successes of U.S. Uh, policy over the past years, both in this administration and the previous, has been the ability to work with China on the North Korea problem. But the closer that we work with China on the North, North Korea problem, the less the North Koreans want to deal with the Chinese, whether it's in the six-party format, which they host, or whether it's in a bilateral well, fashion. That's interesting. What, what do they want to talk to us about? I mean, I well, I mean, so I think their talking point is that, uh, you know, they would like normalized relations with the United States, they would like a peace treaty, they'd like economic assistance, they'd like to be removed completely from all the sanctions going back to the Korean War, all this sort of stuff. Um, the problem is in exchange for what? Yeah. And, and I think uh, whether it's this administration or the past administration, if they were genuinely committed to putting their weapons on the table, Anything is possible. I would say that was, that's the case for this administration, at least my reading of it. I would say that was the case for the past administration, contrary to what people might, might think. Uh, the problem is, is that you know, North Korea essentially wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to be recognized by the United States. It does want a peace treaty. It wants all of these things. But at the same time, it'd like to keep its It uh, wants to be a nuclear, nuclear weapons. Power. Right. And to the extent that they want to engage with Ambassador Davies, they would like to engage with ba Ambassador Davies not on denuclearization talks. They'd like to engage with Ambassador Davies on arms control, just as the, U the US and the Soviet Union did during the Cold War days. Now, that's a pretty far out proposition. But you know, as the negotiator, that's the matrix that you have to deal with. And it's, I mean, it's challenging. I mean, it's very uh, difficult. You know, uh, you all touched on this a while ago, and I'd just like to ask all three of you, and that is, uh, uh, when you talked about China, they're making concern. They don't want to see this this government collapse. They don't want to see this economy collapse. What is the state of North Korea? Is is that likely that this whole thing might just fall in? Um, well, I think it's um, the economic situation is not good. Um, in the two years that the North Korean new North Korean leader has been in power. Um, the most disappointing thing, in my opinion, has not been the nuclear test and the missile test and the provocations, because we expect those. It's been the absence of any real sign of economic reform. You know, small things here and there, but no real sign of economic reform. For a guy who supposedly was educated for part of his life outside of North Korea, uh, there are many theories bandied about in think tanks and academia about how you had this younger generation of leadership that would be interested in opening to it. All that's gone, right? Nobody believes that anymore. 
And so the economic future is not good. I mean, the, the only thing that they have going for them right now are a, you know, a group of economic agreements they did with China in, like, from about 2008 onwards that extract a lot of the minerals out of North Korea into China. So there's money flowing in through that, but there's not a broader answer to the economic problem. And meanwhile, on the political side, you know, as you mentioned, you know, this leader executed his uncle, right, the number two in charge. Now, is that a sign of power consolidation, a guy who's fully in control, or is that a sign of sending a message because things are not okay inside of North Korea? So, um, you know, I think there have always been debates about the extent to which North Korea is ready to reform or it's about to collapse, right? I think there have been more predictions about reform than, than there have been about collapse. Those predictions about reform have been wrong. So what does that leave you with? Right? <laughs> it leaves you only with one thing. And, uh, and you know, I think to the credit of a lot of countries, they're think, you know, they don't talk about it, but I think they're thinking about it a lot more. We as analysts are thinking about that a lot more now. Though no one can predict an Arab Spring in North Korea, you know, you're thinking about it a lot more just because all the variables are just lining up in a direction that tell you this is not going in a good, in a good way. Well, I mean, I don't think that anyone's predicting an Arab Spring in North Korea, but I don't think anybody predicted an Arab Spring in the Arab yeah, world. Yeah. And who would have thought that Hosni Mubarak, um, Muammar Gaddafi in particular, eventually, you know, I think everyone hopes um, Bashar al-Assad will fall. Um, and as, as uh, Victor said, I, I mean, there is a very big power struggle, I think, going on that a lot of us don't know about, obviously, the details. But you can see from the execution of his uncle, from the fact that he also sacked another, um, the number two in the country, um, just recently, uh, one of the major military uh, generals, um, and is trying to replace with his own people. We recently, uh, we interviewed, CNN interviewed um, a former insider um, of Kim Jong-il, the, the father. And he said that, the, that Kim Jong-un, it's not the same because Kim Jong-il had this institutional framework, this intelligence network that they called the good old boys network that these were the ones that helped him get things done, that they protected him, that that's where he took his power. Um, and it built up over his life. But Kim Jong-un doesn't have power that he earned or that he earned any kind of respect. He was given the power symbolically. And that, that this gentleman said, well, he may have friends in you know, Swiss boarding schools, but he doesn't have any friends with inside North Korea. And so as he continues to purge, he has even few people to stand by him to help him get things done. And as North Korea, even though we call it the Hermit Kingdom, it is opening up in the sense that some people are watching the inter looking at the internet, watching Western films and South Korean films. I mean, eventually, this will continue to permeate. And as that continues to rise, and Kim Jong-un's power continues to, to fall, I think, as he has less and less people, around him, I, I think we, we have to predict some kind of um, collapse at some point. Really? All right, well, let's take a few questions. Here's one right here. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. I want to focus this back to the South. Uh, they have been through a terribly traumatic experience, which has revealed stem to stern failures in society and government from regulation to the inept performance of the Coast Guard. Is this going to lead to real change in governance in society, or is they just going to let things go back to business as usual after the hubbub dies down? Yeah. Who'd like to? Yeah, um, yeah Mike, it's a good question. You know, I, I think you're right, first of all. I mean, this has been, I mean, you know, President Park, when she came into office, she was preparing for a crisis, but this was not the crisis she was preparing for. I mean, she was preparing for the last crisis, which was North Korean provocations and creating a government mechanism to respond rapidly to that, you know, two national security advisors, all this sort of stuff. And then this thing comes along, which is completely unexpected. Um, uh, uh, you know, I think we're, they're still going through a very difficult period right now. And they still need to recover all the bodies, all of this. 
Um, but I do expect to see some major reforms in terms of public safety um, and, and qualification of people who operate these sorts of vessels. I mean, one of the things that I think you can say about um, uh, um, Korean society and Korean institutions is that you know, they go at 100 miles an hour and something breaks down. But when that thing breaks down, they really try to fix it, right? Whether you're talking about Korean corporations after the financial crisis or uh, you know, a, a new ROE when it comes to North Korean pro rule, of, rule of engagement when it comes to North Korean provocations, um, they have a system that um, will focus on this and will try to fix it. So I think that it's not going to go back to business as usual. We're probably going to see some major, major reforms uh, inside of the country when it comes to things uh, like public safety. I think it's not only on the kind of ferry industry, but also in terms of, you know, North, uh, South Korea has seen this massive growth over the last few decades, and at the expense of that has been kind of the regulation um, that the government has kind of looked the other way in a lot of terms of the regulation. And I think a lot of people in South Korea are asking, like, what has been the cost for all of this growth you know, is it, do we need to slow down and, and pay more attention to you know, quality rather than quantity? And I, and I also, um, CSIS came out with a very interesting um, paper uh, in the last few days about the economic impact of the ferry disaster on South Korea that, you know, this has really rocked the nation and people aren't going out as much. They're staying home, they're canceling travel plans and this is going to affect business. And, and so I think that this has been a very profound um, tragedy and a prof have had a profound effect on the country. President Park's um, approval rating has dipped, I think, about 11% till before the bef ferry disaster, till about 48%, which I think is an all-time low. Yeah. Do either of you have any doubt that if the North should take some provocative action, and I don't mean just firing shells into the sea or something like that, but something like happened in the previous administration, that this president will react and react strongly? Well, let me just, I, I think that one of the strengths that uh, President Park has brought to this has been a, a real kind of uh, clear vision about how to deal with North Korea. And I think she's taken a very principled approach. She laid it all out before she even came into office in a famous article in Foreign Policy. Uh, and and you know, it's called Trust Polity. Um, and I think she's been tremendously sure-footed and astute about her approach to North Korea. And she said, while the president was there, just in the very recent past, that should the North Koreans provoke uh, engage in a so-called strategic pro provocation, a nuclear test or long-range missile launch, that it would put in jeopardy, uh, certainly the immediate prospects for Sixth Party, and that there would have to be a very, very strong reaction to that. And she would, I'm sure, do everything she could to ensure that the ROK was in the forefront of that. So uh, I think the North Koreans have the message that uh, if they decide to do that again, uh, they're going to buy themselves a world of hurt. And but I mean, what if, what if they sink a ship or something like that? Uh, well, uh, if, they, if they go back to the kinds of actions they took in 2010, the sinking of the Shonan, the Corvette, uh, the shelling of Waipido Island and so forth, um, it's my belief, I'm not a military expert, but that the, um, that the ROK would be prepared, and they've said this publicly, to react very sharply, strongly, and disproportionately to that. To that. And they tried to message that in uh, you know, stereophonic sound to North Korea. So I, I think that may be one of the reasons why there could be some hesitation on the part of uh, the regime in Pyongyang to, to engage in that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, the thing that worries me is, you know, you know, Bob, in terms of your question, is that you know, the North Koreans do another exercise Right? And they, tr they mean to sort of pound, pound water. And then you get a stray shell or two that hits an island or, and, and basically kills South Koreans. I think, you know, that in a situation like that, I worry very much about, because I think she will. She will respond immediately and vigorously, perhaps disproportionately. I don't know. And then you get a terrible escalation dynamic. I mean, I agree with everybody here. She's very clear-headed on North Korea. She is the only South Korean president that has come into office who has already visited North Korea and met with the leadership before she ever became president. She did it as a politician. So she doesn't come into office 
as previous presidents with this obsession before they leave office. They've got to make the pilgrimage right, <laughs> to the north and, you know, and show that they're trying to create unification. Been there and done that. Been there and done that. She does, so she, it's, it's very different, I think, for her. And, that, and she's a lot more clear-headed. Right here, you had asked, right here. This spring, the UN Human Rights Commission came out with an unprecedented report about human rights uh, in, in North Korea, including unbelievable descriptions of concentration camps indistinguishable from Nazi Germany or Pol Pot. And um, I'm trying to figure out why you news guys haven't shined a light on that. I mean, even if these nuclear weapons are bargained away, those camps will endure. And the ultimate atrocity would be to offer this regime some guarantees of non-interference, of preservation. That would be the ultimate human atrocity. Why can't we get you guys to shine a light on that report? Well, I'll it turn was just to a lease. <laughs> you can take question. it if you want. But, um, <laughs> it's really hard to get into North Korea. I, I, I'll be completely frank. It's much easier to report about North Korea and the human rights abuses outside of North Korea. Once in a while, we're lucky and we'll get a defector that comes out. Um, a lot of times, we'll, you know, we'll if, if journalists are allowed in the country, you have a minder. I'm talking about the report itself. I, I think that there was some. I mean, clearly not enough. But as Bob said in the beginning of the um, beginning of the uh, session. You know, a lot of times international news kind of is dominated by the news of the day. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that that's a reason why it wouldn't. If it was a slow news day, maybe it would have gotten a lot of attention. Recently, um, you know, we did something. We, you know, we a lot of times will use that as an opportunity to take a look at a lot of things. You had these drones over the last week that were found in South Korea that were believed to be from North Korea. You had these racial slurs that were coming back and forth. Um, about President Obama and President Park. And then we used that to look in the human rights report. This was around the time that a French photographer um, was able to smuggle some really shocking images of, of you know, the famine and, and widespread um, damage to infrastructure and everything that's coming out. It is really hard to report on North Korea. Um, we should do more. We kind of do talk about the human rights as a kind of on the periphery of what's going on with the security challenges. Um, it, it is a challenge. I'll, I'll, it's I won't it's a valid criticism. But you know, it's a criticism you can always make. There's always some story that we ought to be giving more attention to that, for one reason or another, uh, we're not able to. And right now, I mean, we're just so overloaded with, with news about other things that, that that hasn't gotten the attention that I think you're right. I if if I could just say, though, I'm sorry, Bob, but yeah. the President of the United States did talk about this. I think this was a landmark report done by Justice Michael Kirby, the Australian jurist who led the effort along with a group from the international community. It was a great day when the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva could get this thing launched. And you may know some of the machinations that went into making that uh, possible. This needs to be followed up on. The government of the Republic of Korea has said, uh, signaled that they'll host this office, the permanent uh, office to take names, hold account those responsible for these depredations. I mean, this is just the beginning of this process. And it is something we need to talk about, part and parcel of this tableau, this issue, this problem, this challenge uh, that is North Korea, that is the most uh, uh, significant uh, egregious outlier in the international system. So uh, we're talking about it. We're talking about it. But there are many facets of this issue, and we've got to deal with all of them. As the president said in Seoul, we can't uh, pick and choose among the issues that we Right back here, lighting. Hi, Rachel Oswald, National Journal. Ambassador Davies, if you could just comment on um, possible uh, changes in U.S. policy toward um, returning to the six-party talks, it had previously been stated that the United States needed concrete proof of North Korea's intent to permanently denuclearize but recently there have been unconfirmed reports coming out of some of the bilateral talks um, I believe you've had with uh, the Chinese that you could accept a return to the um, so-called Leap Day Agreement, the moratorium. Yeah, Le Leap, Leap Day is history. I mean, Le Leap Day was a valiant uh, attempt and kind of minor key to get at this problem and kickstart uh, six-party talks. It was never meant to, no, not even on paper, it was a declaratory deal uh, that, we, that we reached. 
uh, and we hope to create space to restart uh, six parties. So we don't talk in terms of leap day or returning to leap day. Um, we'll see about six party. It does depend on whether the North Koreans will make the right choice and move back in the direction of the five parties uh, position, which is that denuclearization, which is the bedrock of the six party process, the sine qua non of it, the centerpiece of uh, the September 2005 joint statement. You know, will they uh, accept the fact that that should be the premise to it? And in terms of the sequencing and what has to be done beforehand, what has to be done afterward, I mean, all I'll say is that it's a canard, it's ridiculous to suggest that the, North Korea, that the United States is insisting North Korea must completely denuclearize before we go back to six party. That's not true. But we need earnest money. We need to see that North Korea is serious about this. We need to see that they accept that this is the fundamental premise of six party talks. We'd like to see them take concrete actions. It's important that they do so. The stuff they've got to do, they know what they have to do. And what they do, quite frankly, in the initial stages would be perfectly reversible steps that they would take declaratory steps. So the fact that they're not interested in going back in that direction, the fact that they're not even interested in uh, resolving the cases of Americans who've been in prison in North Korea tells you something about their current interest in going back to multilateral diplomacy and six-party talks. So our position hasn't changed. It's been consistent over five years. We're going to stick with it. We're going to stick with our partners, our allies, and uh, the other members of the five parties, and we're going to hold North Korea to account. That's where we are and where we'll be. How about on this side of the room, Mike? All right, right here. Hi, Sidney Friedberg, BreakingDefense.com. Uh, the interests of the five parties are not perfectly congruent. Uh, to say the least, I mean, we talk about you know, Russia and China. Russia has obviously been a little bit problematic lately uh, on its western border, uh, and there are repercussions on the east. Uh, China is increasingly, it seems, provocative, uh, including you know, claiming bits of uh, uh, Aedo Rock, uh, as well as Japanese territory uh, with the air defense zone. I mean, zooming back, from the immediate problem of North Korea, it seems like the regional context has gotten a lot more complicated and a lot harder uh, than it was you know, the last time we did the six party thing. Since you know, one third of the six parties are now making a lot more trouble than they were. Well, can I take that on quickly? Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> just to say that you've just helped describe the degree of difficulty of uh, the six party talks to some extent. But there is one issue on which we all agree. And that is this issue of the necessity of denuclearization occurring uh, in, on the peninsula, which means North Korea giving up its nuclear weapons. And you know, despite these uh, regional differences that continue to bubble up and sometimes bubble over, uh, we are still able uh, to talk to Russia about North Korea, to talk to China about North Korea. I've had talks just in recent weeks with my opposite number, Ambassador Wu Dawei, the first trilateral meeting uh, at uh, call that ambassadorial level, after the President of the United States brought the Prime Minister of Japan and the uh, President of South Korea together in The Hague, was uh, my hosting my Japanese and South Korean counterparts in Washington. So uh, there is still enough commonality, and I think it's growing, and I think it's sufficient, that despite the differences at the margins we have uh, in terms of our uh, strategic interests, this can be done. Diplomacy can work. Uh, there is really no magic in it, but it does come down to presenting North Korea with a choice where it really only has one choice, and that is to go down the peaceful diplomatic path of denuclearization. That's what we're working on, uh, and I believe that someday we'll succeed. I hope I'm the guy you know, who's around to see that happen. Uh, my father, who was a diplomat from the late 40s through 1980, Sovietologist, ended up uh, in Poland as our ambassador, retired. Ten years later, he saw the wall fall. I mean, this stuff takes time, folks. And the President of the United States tried to explain that in Seoul. Stuff's not self-evident. It's uh, not easy. You've got to use all elements of your national power, military, diplomatic, uh, uh, your so-called soft power. Uh, and you've got to bring it all together, and you've got to work your alliances, and you've got to make your arguments, and you've got to try to win people over to the notion that there is a better way forward, and here's how it works, and here's how you, wherever you are, I don't care on what continent, 
can play a role in this thing. All right. So that's what we're doing. One more question, and this lady right here. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group. My question is, under the current situation, what do you think that exactly the international community can do to help uh, the people in North Korea, and uh, especially on human rights issues? Sure. Thanks. Uh, let me try that real quick, sure. which is sure. to send a strong, unified, consistent message to Pyongyang that they need to change their behavior and how they treat their people. That's key. And I think it's also important to tell other regional actors, including China, what they think about the situation inside North Korea. So you can bring about change, but it can only be if the world speaks as one voice and demands it. Can I just say, I mean, so I think it was mentioned, so the COI report is a watershed. I think that's a very important moment, a very important platform on which to build more international consensus, more international recognition of the human rights problem as being a major impediment to North Korea's um, uh, joining the world community. It's not just about nuclear weapons. And so, so I think the C everybody should be pivoting, if you will, off the COI report. I will just say, as a last bit of it, that CSIS is going to be doing that. And, and, soon it, and very soon, we're going to be announcing, releasing a new project that we'll be working on with regard to looking at what the practical policy implications are that come from the Commission of Inquiry report. So just, sorry, a little bit of advertising. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, on behalf of CSIS and TCU, I thank you all for coming. I learned a lot. I hope you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That was a lot of fun. That was really good. You all were great.